hashtag pick Rich's brain. Answering the questions you want answered. I'm here for you. I'm here to provide value. All these years of experience, bleh, cutting myself open and answering your questions. Drummer, percussionist, author, composer, songwriter, producer, professional speaker, actor. Rich Redmond has left his mark on thousands of songs, including over 21 number one hits. Over 30 years of been there, done that wisdom and knowledge in the Nashville music business. This is Pick Rich's Brain. Eventually, we're going to get into a nice format where I have awesome guests. I mean, how many musicians and drummers and actors and speakers and authors do I know in the world? Lots. And so we're going to have an endless supply of people that I can have on this show. So Jim says that we have a lot of people tuning in. Thank you guys so much for being here. We're in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. I moved here 20 years ago this month. I don't remember the exact date. I would have to ask my buddy Jim Riley. Jim Riley is my good buddy. He's the drummer for the Rascal Flats, and um, Jim is actually trying to point out something, but I did—I don't have my readers. I can't. Like, I'm supposed to read that far. Well, first off, we're going to kick it off with uh, what we got going on, quick promos. Quick promos. So, guys, off camera, my muse, my Ed McMahon, my 10-year good pal, Jim McCarthy. Check out JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. We met for the first time after meeting on MySpace. Do you guys remember that? The year was 2006, 2007. Crazy. Uh, maybe, two, I think it was 2006, because it was, was MySpace. It was, I think it was 07. It was the end of MySpace, and he was he's my voiceover teacher. He's my voiceover mentor, and he's definitely better than I am, but uh, we're both from Connecticut, and we both play the drum. So pretty cool thing. And if you ever listen to Jack FM, you've heard Jim many, many, many times on Jack many, FM. Many, many times. We're Mix 92.9. Yeah. We have messages on hold, all that good stuff. So, Sticks of March. So sticks, sticks of March. Okay, so Jim wants me to go right into being a promo sexual, <laughs> and that's fine. But these are my uh, these are my Promark Active Grip 595 Signature Rich Redmond Drumsticks. They took four or five years to develop, but really 46 years to develop. And uh, they're black, they're red. They come with a proprietary finish on there that actually heats up. The actually the finish gets a little sticky, a little tacky as your body temperature rises. You know, I get kind of tacky too after a couple of Irish coffees. You know. Uh, this is so convenient. This whole thing right here is just fantastic. So these are in stores everywhere, but people are always emailing me and texting me and tweeting me and sending me DMs and saying, Rich, where can I get your drumsticks? Google it. Rich Redmond Signature Drumsticks. You're going to find them online at Guitar Center Online, Sam Ash Online, a Musician's Friend, Amazon. Just go to Amazon. You're probably going to get the best deal on Amazon, and it's going to be cheaper for you. I'll make less of a profit, but oh, I want the deal for you. So go to Amazon.com, and while you're at Amazon.com, Check out my book, Fundamentals of Drumming for Kids. It's uh, for kids ages 5 to 10. It's a book I wrote with my dear friend Michael Obrecht. And um, it is a program that will work for a five-year-old drummer or a 50-year-old man that acts like a five-year-old. So check that out, Amazon.com. What else, Jim? Uh, let's see. We have uh, the Drumming in the Modern World Chapters Bundle, only 99 bucks this month with a pair of your sticks. This is fantastic. We are in full promosexual mode. Uh, so what is drumming in the modern world? So if you check out www.drumminginthemodernworld.com, this is my 38, 39 years of drumming experience all encapsulated in one six and a half hour program. It's shot in HD, HD quality audio and video, seven camera angles. It was recorded at an iconic studio that was owned by Mr. Ronnie Millsap called Ronnie's Place here in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, it's basically, oh uh, God, 120 mini movies. Uh, me deconstructing the Jason Aldean drum parts from all the hit songs. Me doing performances of songs in styles that include country, alt country, country pop, metal, folk, dance music. Um, and those are shot in all high quality. And it was directed by my friend Eric Doris, who directed both of Todd Zuckerman's Methods and Mechanics, one and two award winning DVDs. And there's also lessons and gems of wisdom and on and on and on drum solos, stuff you can use to learn and stuff you can use to teach. And maybe in a year or so, the next phase of this project is every one of these solos, every one of these songs will be transcribed and there will also be music, no drums, and a click. So you'll be able to play along to all the songs that you are actually going to see me performing on this product. And so this month, Sticks of March, it's a chapter bundle. It's nine chapters. 
And it's six and a half hours of material. Normally $129 is now $99 and you will get a pair of Rich Redmond signature drumsticks that I hope you will enjoy. The feedback on this product has been excellent. It's been a grassroots movement. Like mo most things in my life, it's just a slow burn. Um, but people that are checking this product out, they're like, oh, it feels really good. It looks unique. I like the tip. I like the fact that there's an abrupt um, taper here, which is good for hard hitters like me that kind of spread the butter on the hi-hat. But you could also use it for jazz, Latin, different lighter styles of music. They're not too heavy. And also the feedback that I'm getting is that these things last forever. People are like taking pictures of them and going, dude, I've been using these things all week in a hard rock band and I still have the same pair, which is a great thing. What else, Jim? Uh, basically, one one other thing, one little uh, more promosexual thing is... Uh, Hashtag promosexual. Subscribe, <laughs> subscribe and share your YouTube channel and once again with the sticks because it is the sticks of March you can be entered to win a, a brick of Rich's sticks currently at 4,400 subscribers. We're trying to hit the 5K mark this month. This month. Okay, so the goal is for to get 600 more subscribers to my YouTube channel. And why do I ask you guys to subscribe to the, this YouTube channel? YouTube.com forward slash Rich Redmond, R-E-D-M-O-N-D. -E and the reason why I want you to check it out is because there is some value there. For over a decade, I have been populating this channel with live performances, footage of rehearsals, footage of recording sessions, um, gems of wisdom, advice on how to navigate the music business and live a better life and uh, other lessons you know it's a lot of lot of content there a lot of value there's even some short films on there uh, with me as a comedic and dramatic actor so uh, a lot of, a lot of stuff for the whole family to enjoy so Subscribe to my YouTube channel and enter it. It's basically you're going to have a chance to win an entire brick of my sticks. Yeah, 12 pairs. 12 pairs. So basically, uh, so getting into the questions portion. Of the question portions of Pick Rich's Brain, hashtag Pick Rich's Brain. That's right. Brought to you by Pick Rich's Brain. Yes. The, uh, the, we, we find a lot of themes that kind of come through, and I try to organize them that way. Can you guys hear Jim? He's, yeah, I, think, I think so. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, the first question is from Karen Marones. She basically comes out of the gate and asks, how did you get connected with Jason? How did that all begin? Yeah, you know, most people um, assume that the music business is based on auditioning, 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 and auditioning. And I will say this, that the majority of gigs that are happening in the world are all happening because of personal relationships. Even if you do have to audition, a personal relationship is usually established with somebody in that as organization a gatekeeper you never know where your next gig is going to come from it could come from the the um the secretary at a studio at the front desk it could come from the wardrobe assistant it come, could come from the stylist it could come from the assistant manager it could come from the road manager someone in the band so the the moral of the story is to have lots of friends and know lots of people but more importantly a lot of people need to know you and they be able they have to be able to trust you and put their faith in you and know that when you have an opportunity and a door is open for you, you'll be able to knock that opportunity out of the ballpark. Home run every time. So uh, for me, um, there's a bass player named Tully Kennedy, who's a dear friend of mine. Um, been playing with him for close to 20 years. And he met a young Jason Aldean and, and one thing led to the next. And the next thing you know, we were playing music together and fast forward 20 years, here we are. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> it's a There's a lot happening in the middle, but you'll have to buy the book for that. Right on. Yeah. Uh, next question would be Matt Campbell. He asks, what was a game-changing moment in your career? I love that. That's the Vic Firth model. All the Vic Firth artists have to answer that question. Mm -hmm. What was the big game-changing moment? And so, um, you know, for my friend, my friend Mark Schulman, he answered. He said a big game-changing moment was then he was auditioning for the the keyboard player for Journey, and and he was rushing for whatever reason, and the the guy threw him a metronome and said, "Watch the light." And you know, I I feel okay telling the story because Mark would tell the story over and over and over. And so, what did he do? He went and he got training and he worked on his time diligently and you will never hear Mark Shulman ever rush or drag ever again because he worked on it and he focused on it tens of thousands of hours or it was Kenny Aronoff when he knew he had to do a drum solo on Jack and Diane and he was walking to his drum set and it was like oh my god I've got to I've got to figure out something between here and there I have 10 feet to change the rest of my life right and so for me um, a game-changing moment game-changing moment. Well, the first opportunity, the big opportunity I had was there was a drummer named Jim White, and he was friends with the road manager 
of a gal named Pam Tillis. And so I had been in Nashville for two years and I'd been kicking around and this was my first opportunity to have a marquee gig. So Pam Tillis was the first person that had hired me where I was on the tour bus all the time. I was a salaried musician. I had a drum tech. Somebody was setting up and tearing my drums for me and they were handing me a bottle of water. Here you go, Mr. Redmond, and a towel. I was like, really? And I was do blah, bam. I would play the end. I was like, leave. I could leave. Somebody else would break down. I was like, this is insane. What? Because the, the muscle memory involved in playing a gig, do, 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 blah, bam. Good night, Dallas. And then I would immediately start taking my drums down. It's just like built into your DNA. But that was, uh, that would kind of open the floodgates where I got a taste of, wow, these are 18 top 10 singles here that everyone knows all the words to. She has such loyal fans. And so it was like a really good thing to get that taste in my mouth. Um, and it set the tone for everything else that I was able to accomplish in Nashville. Most people know me as the drummer with Jason Aldean, you know, playing on these, you know, uh, 19 whatever number one songs and, you know, playing these shows everywhere to big crowds and, you know, honoring this rock and roll sound that we kind of helped create together. But if you were to go to richredman.com, you could see that I've played with, um, you know, people like Gene Watson and Earl Thomas Conley and Vince Gill and then, you know, Bob Seger and Brian Adams and Ludacris and Kelly Clarkson and I even know Luke Bryan. So, uh, you know, so, so kind of crazy things have happened in the last 20 years. Cameron Ferguson asks... How do I manage my finances as a drummer? That's fantastic. What finances? <laughs> <laughs> this is so convenient. Um, I actually have five... I have an offer to do five minutes in front of anyone at Zany's Comedy Club, and I will do it. I'm going to honor it, but I am bringing a symbol out on stage. In case there's an abort mission, I can just hit the crash symbol and whew, gives me enough time to get off stage. It's all about timing and preparedness. Yeah, timing and preparedness, yep. Um, yeah, the thing is about the music industry, it is this. It is a roller coaster more than any other business. So it's really smart to, when you are making money, to set some money aside because you don't know how long. This especially goes for my friends in New York and Los Angeles because in New York and Los Angeles, you do a record and you're out with an artist and you might be out for a year. You might be out for six months and you're, you're paid weekly, right? So you might have to like, you know, sublet your apartment or put your things in storage so you're not like, you you know, hemorrhaging money to live in Los Angeles and New York, but you're really on a tour bus or an airplane or in a hotel room, right? Um, so a lot of those guys will know, wow, I've got steady work for six months. And so they'll look at their budget for six months and they go, I'm going to make a set amount of money and I need to put as much away as possible because I don't know what's going to happen after this tour. Is the artist going to have me back? Is she going to hire a whole new, new group of guys? Is she taking time off to have a baby? Is she going off to do a movie? What's happening? Um, and in Nashville, what's really kind of cool is that you are paid per per show and a lot of artists, I mean in the early stages you don't know your schedule a year out. You might know your schedule a month out. You might know your schedule three months out. I'm lucky that I pretty much know my schedule a year out. Oh, I'm, I'm in the habit of like, I'm staring at myself and I'm playing to myself right there. But I'm looking here. Okay, so yeah, so uh, you just kind of have to save when the money is there. Save for a rainy day. Save for a rainy day. And in this modern music business, it's really difficult to do just one thing. And all the people that were thriving in the 80s and 90s are, many of them are still thriving, but a lot of them are just at the survival point. And to do that, they're having to wear a lot of different hats. Things that you wouldn't consider doing back in the day. A recording drummer that was doing three double, ma double master scale sessions a day wasn't going to go out on the road. But nowadays, um, there's very reputable drummers that are working the road, they're working studios, they're doing showcases, they're writing songs, they're producing records, maybe they write a book, you get even crazier like me, you start doing speaking and then you're, you know, you're hosting, you're acting, you're doing some different stuff. My thing is I just want to be creative. Really, I love to play the drums, but if I can also be creative in other ways, that also makes me happy as well. So, save your money. Yeah. Kent Roderick. Kent, I know, yeah, I know Kent, yeah. It's kind of a, uh, you know, kind of, I would imagine the common question that we would get. What's your favorite song to play? I love that. Um, some of my favorite songs that we recorded were B-sides that were never released. And there's a song called Water Towers that is so transparent and so ghostly and it's almost it's haunting. And I play next to nothing at the, on that record, on that song. But it's, it's... 
it's special. It's special. Um, there's also a song called Staring at the Sun. I believe it was on the Night Train record, where there's the tempo is so earthy and it's almost like a dirge and it it's, has an R&B feel and there's so much space. I'm proud of that. And I also got to play one of those snare drums, what I call a Fleetwood Mac type snare drum, something you would hear on the record rumors. They call it a baseball bat and a birthday cake. <laughs> You know, and it just is one of the sexiest sounds to my ears because, you know, anybody can just take a snare drum and just crank it up, you know, and that's a very common sound. But to take the time to figure out how to get that really kind of earthy, special sound, Stan Lynch was great at that. Um, uh, the Fleetwood Mac guys were, you know, great at that. Um, Mick Fleetwood. All the uh, R&B guys were really great at that. So that's a really good song. The live set, you know, I always liked playing Johnny Cash. We're not playing that live anymore, but it was great because it had a nice spring to it. And there was a drum solo. There was a six beat drum fill. I got boom, bang. I still to this day, thank you, Michael Knox, do not know how I got away with that, but I got away with it, so thanks. Right on. There's uh, J.C. Duncan is actually watching the stream right now, and he's asking, did you ever plateau with your playing and lose interest? If so, how did you get out of it? Wow. That's a great question because, you know, it's kind of a long life. I love what I do, um, but, you know, I'm in the game now of... I put in tens and tens and thousands of hours of practice as a younger man. And you reach a point where you start playing music for a living and you spend all of your time traveling. And then when you get to the venue, you're playing those 20 songs, right? Which is a luxury. If you get to the point where you're playing 20 hit songs that everybody in that audience knows the, the words to, talk about grateful. That's a very unique spot to be in. Um, but I think just keeping yourself inspired, forcing yourself to listen to new music and study. So if there's skill sets you don't have, like if you don't know how to read music and you've really never branched out to playing other kinds of music, um, you know, I have my drum camp coming up in Los Angeles and one of my teachers is a guy named Greg Bissonette. So look up Greg Bissonette. He's one of the most versatile drummers on the planet. He truly does have experience playing polkas, playing television music, playing, um, playing uh, Brazilian music, Latin music. He recorded on a set on on Joe Satriani's record, he played double bass with David Lee Roth. He plays double drums with Ringo Starr. Now, you don't get these type of jobs if you're not incredibly versatile. He has, an, he has a musical mind. So maybe take a break from the drums and learn to play another instrument. And also for me, I worked on timpani, I worked on marimba, I can play um, vaudeville xylophone, I could play some jazz vibraphone. Um, I worked on reading trumpet and violin on a marimba. And I taught myself how to play congas, and then that led to me studying djembe and cajon, and just get out and play some different music and learn, get some different skill sets together, or go on vacation. Like, just take a break from the drums, so that when you come back, it's that, oh, I missed you so much, baby, and you start that love affair again, you know? And so maybe just play with some different musicians, shake things up, and I promise you, you'll come back rejuvenated. I just got back from Aruba. Can't you tell I'm so dark? I'm very, very dark. And so I didn't pick up a pair of sticks. Uh-uh. No, not for five days. But that's okay because I put so much muscle memory, so much practice into my craft that there's muscle memory. Muscle memory is the relationship between the body and the mind. And when you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, it's almost like a bodybuilder and his relationship with his muscles and the sinews and the way the fibers react and, and how, how that all goes together. For me, it was a practice pad. It was me being on drums. It was me holding four mallets, four mallet marimba, and just practicing that slap on the conga, whap, 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 over and over and over. So I hope that helps. So uh, yeah, change it up and you'll come back refreshed. Um, this is an interesting question. Matt Gretter asks, Yeah. Being someone who doesn't have great social skills, for lack of a better phrase, <laughs> I know Matt. He's got great social skills. He's come to two of my camps. He's a great guy. Matt, you're a great guy. He says, how can I make my presence known? Obviously, you remembered him. Yeah, dude, I'm no, I know you. Matt, 
know you right away. We went to lunch together. You were chewing my ear off, man. He plays in a bunch of bands in uh, North, Northern California, which is great. And he's a mechanic by trade, which is great, which is a great skill to have. That'll never go out of style. And I will tell you what, it's great to have another skill set. You know, some guys buy property and they rent properties out or, you know, some guys teach music during the week and then they play on the weekend. You know, whatever things you're going to do to put your put things together so you can keep your feet in music. You know, that's the that's the goal is to be able to keep playing your instrument. But I think your social skills are fine, Matt. I mean, um, you know, birds of a feather flock together. Maybe when you go out and you're mingling with people on the town, take some trusted friends with you. You know, I did that in Nashville. My my best pals, Kurt Allison and Tully Kennedy, for like a straight up decade, if not longer, everywhere we went was like Night at the Roxbury. It was like... It was us three guys in our freaking leather jackets that we scoured Melrose Avenue for to find the best leather jackets that would all fit us and that we, we could afford at the time, which was saying a lot. And we would always find the time and the money that we would figure it out to go out together and make our presence known so people realized that we were a rhythm section and we were in it to win it together as a team. So maybe you surround yourself with birds of a feather and um, I, I think you're fine. I like you a lot, Matt. I'm gonna ask you, what would you like to ask them? I'll say my question to the audience watching, who would you like to see on Pickwitch's brain moving forward as a guest? Yeah, we're, we started to start compiling a list of guests. Yeah. And it's pretty deep, because like I said, really the three things we're focusing on on this podcast, vodcast, web, webisode, is music, motivation, and success. And I was, I was just a guest on a success podcast last night. It was called WTF is Success. What the? It's a good name. It really is. And it was for a fellow drummer slash comedian in Los Angeles. And so I was a guest on his podcast. And in the, one of the, main, the questions was, how do you define success? And that is very, very crucial for us before we start setting any goals is defining, defining for ourselves what success is to us. So I do remember writing down very specifically what I wanted out of life. I crafted that into a single sentence that was easy to repeat. I wrote it out. I laminated it. I put it on my refrigerator. I put it on my microwave. You put it on your rear view mirror. You put it in your back pocket. You put it by, on your bathroom mirror. And you read it every day, especially when you get up in the morning and before you go to bed at night. Because what happens between you falling asleep and you waking up is powerful. It's almost like the Matrix, you know, like, you know, like... Keno Reeves was in that that thing, you know, but the mind, things with the mind is very, very active. Or was that Minority Report? I forget, but either it was some sort of a science fiction thing. But the mind, you're sleeping, but your mind is very active. So it's really good to feed your mind before you go to bed some really positive stuff to lay the groundwork for the next day. Right on. Um, I would ask uh, what... What's, what's a good book uh, other than the standards that you have read that you would recommend for someone to read? I like The Law of Success by Napoleon Hill. I like Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I like... Um, there's a book called Never Eat Alone. It's, I forget the author. It's in the other room right there. But anything from Napoleon Hill, Zig Ziglar, Awaken the Giant Within from Tony Robbins. Uh, Never Eat Alone is really good. It's, I, and... In later years, I have been eating alone, but every time you go out to eat, it's awesome if you can kill two birds with one stone and you can be in a social interaction with somebody, especially if they're part of your mastermind alliance or if they're a birds of a feather type person. Like like whenever I'm in Los Angeles, I'll find myself and I'm going to go lunch. I'm going to have lunch with my buddy Jason Sutter or my buddy Mark Schulman or you know guys are Matt Starr. These are because these are guys that that. They're high achieving, they're high energy, and we're always keeping tabs on each other like, what are you working on? What do you want to do this year? How can we help each other? That's what you want in your life, you know, so. I think we're gonna wrap it up, man. Is that it? Yeah, 23 minutes, man. I thought we were doing an hour. I've run out of questions. Oh, yo, Jim is out of questions. <laughs> but what about, uh, do we have any questions coming in on the lives? I've theme? actually, uh, a lot of the questions hmm. we've got recently. There's one here. Um, which, so this is like a sitcom, 22 minutes. Yeah, you know, as it happens. Uh, Zachary Dalen uh, asks, once you build a following <clears throat> and have been playing and have been having personal success at some level, how do you begin building relationships with, and he keeps on skipping down, um, how do you begin to build relationships with companies you would like to endorse? Nice. Um, the best thing you can do, this is a really commonly asked question, great question, but uh, you know, every drummer in the world has been asked about endorsements. And here is the deal. Endorsements are 
mutually beneficial relationships in both ways, okay? So, Sabian Symbols is not going to support me as an artist if my band is not playing in front of large audiences, if my band is not on television, if my band is not recording. They wanna know that Sabian Symbols is going to be seen, heard, and felt in every public arena possible, and they wanna see that little brand, they wanna see that stamp swing, and they wanna see a cameraman over my shoulder getting a picture of that brand. The best thing you can do to cultivate relationships along the way is to meet use the brand that you want to ultimately play. So for Sabian Symbols, I've been here with the family since 2003. I've been with Promark um, since uh, 2004. I've been with Remo since 1993. I've been with DW Drums for six years. Um, you know, Audio Technica for a good six or seven years now. Um, but definitely Remo the longest. They believed in me. They really did believe in me. But you have to find people that believe in you as, as an artist. And it's your responsibility to make sure that that product is seen. You're a spokesperson for that product. And so it's really kind of your responsibility to like, you know, post as much as you possibly can and let the world know that you use this product. And then, and then as a result, you know, if you, well, you, your responsibility is to give feedback on products, like you field test um, prototypes and you can have input on things. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship. So the best way to grow that relationship is to immediately just start. If you love Remo drum heads, don't use any other drum heads. Play Remo, play Remo, play Remo, play Remo, and let Remo know. Put Team Remo, use a hashtag, send them videos, post videos on your YouTube channel, create a following, and then when you are in the right situation um, to command a top level endorsement, that time will be right. And you could also grow that. You know, sometimes they'll start you at like a, a small percentage discount. So if you're cracking symbols, they may replace them or something like that. And that'll grow into the next level and it takes time. But you started, I think you kind of pursued your endorsers, right? I pursued mine. I was already playing the products that I loved and I was just basically letting them know, here's videos, here's my tour schedule, here's the television shows that I'm gonna be on. And they were like, okay, this guy is not messing around. So it was pretty much a no-brainer because I was, I had the tools in the toolbox, and but I was approachable and I was friendly and I was already playing that. And then I grew that relationship by, by showing them that I could be a high-level brand ambassador through recording, through touring, and through education. And to me personally, the best marketing tool in the entire world is education. And I think if you're a drum shop owner out there, or if you're a music store owner, you need to continue to have artists come into your store and share their messaging. And uh, I will say this, there's a handful of us that are keeping the drum clinic alive. There's your Mark Schulman's, your Kenny Aronoff's, your Stanton Moore's, your, it's a small list of guys that are keeping that alive by the sweat of our brow. But it's also up to you, the drumming public, to get off your butt and actually come down to the drum shop and shake someone's hand and be part of a community instead of just sitting and hiding behind a device. It's not the same experience. Go meet the artist. If I was into funk drumming and knew New Orleanian drumming and Stanton Moore was 13 miles from my house, I would put everything on hold and go to that drum shop. I would be there knocking on the door, let, asking them to let me in so I could have the, the front seat. And that's not happening anymore. Why? It's laziness, it's apathy. I don't understand it. It's strange. So I'm gonna keep doing drum clinics and I'm gonna keep bringing my message to any place that somebody will have me. Jim Riley, all these guys that are bringing their, their, their quality messaging and sharing their life experience, you gotta go see these guys. You gotta go see them. That's really interesting. Um, a lot of what you're referring to is also having, and you and I have talked about this, is having that sales ability, uh, being that once you get to town, acknowledging that first and foremost, you are a business, and businesses don't survive without sales. Uh, you're a salesperson, a businessman, then a drummer, a videographer, a photographer, a creative, whatever you want mm -hmm. to be, that's the hierarchy, that's basically where it exists. Would you agree? Yeah, we're all in sales, and you know, I speak, I speak uh, to sales constantly. No one is gonna hire me to be a drummer. 
unless they buy into me as a human being. And I will say that until the day I die. People make the world go round. So it's very beneficial for you to be a likable, enthusiastic person. The more you can have that in your skill set, your personality, your people skills, your bedside manner, being likable, being enthusiastic, exceeding expectations, you're gonna be able to play a lot of drums. This is an expectation. People expect you to be able to play the drums. Duh. But it's the other stuff. It's the other stuff that makes me wanna be around someone. If I'm putting a band together, it's just okay that can get the job done, but is super fun to be around and is responsible and is a great hang and has the whole package and he looks good on stage and he smiles at me and he winks at me. I'm hiring that guy over the phenom that just kind of just has his eyes closed the whole time, you know, and doesn't talk to me on the tour bus. So having a complete package and marketing yourself as a complete product, whether you're a musician or an author or any trade, Matt Gretter, you're a mechanic. You know what I mean? I want to go to a qualified mechanic, but yeah, I want somebody that's going to say, this is the problem, Rich. Somebody that's going to be honest with me, who's going to give me the right price quote, who's going to have it done when they say they're going to have it done, because really, I just want to have my car. I just want my car to work. You know? Right on. Yeah. So wrap it up, man. We're wrapping up. So this was episode two of Pick Rich's Brain. I hope you enjoy this format. We're going to keep doing this. We're going to try to do it at least three times a month. It's going to be in a video uh, format on my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Rich Redmond. It's also, the audio is being removed and is becoming is a podcast. And the podcast lives on Rich Redmond, R-E-D-M-O-N-D dot com. You just go to the media icon on my website, scroll down, and it says podcasts. You'll be able to download the, all the audio straight to your device. All right, so we have two episodes in the can. So I hope you really, really enjoyed this. Make sure that you send questions at your leisure to booking at richredmond.com and we'll, you will answer all these questions on this very show. Jim McCarthy behind the board here. We love him. Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. Yeah. Right on, brother. Yeah, we love him. Uh, next time. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Pick Rich's Brain. Bye.